Thank you all for the honor and trust you've placed in me as the next president of the California Medical Association. In the words of the Bard, I'll pay thy graces home, both in word and deed. Leading this organization is an awesome responsibility to represent CMA in the battle facing medicine in California and nationally. To promote policies for, to protect our patients, our practices, and the ability to care for our communities, while also preventing regulations which often contribute to the ever-increasing problem of physician burnout, resulting in early retirement, career change, frustration, even suicide. 28 years ago, I demanded to know what my dues were paying for. It was bad timing, I think, because that introduced me to one of the greatest conscriptors in organized medicine, Dr. Bob Hertzka, whom my wife and I blame for everything that's happened since, taking me to the depths of organized medicine and politics. But I found colleagues at SDCMS and CMA who believed in helping frame the future of medicine, fighting against those who would dismantle our profession for their own political and financial gain, a grassroots operation that actually acts on behalf of its membership instead of sitting in the doctor's lounge complaining and whining. I found many physician mentors like Dr. Jim Hay, Jay Crossan, Al Ray, Dave Priver, leaders from all over the state, CMA trustees and past presidents who encouraged me to move forward even when our opinions sharply diverged. I don't know where I get more satisfaction, my solo ENT practice in San Diego assisted by the finest office staff one could ever ask for, or my work with CMA. Like my office, CMA is staffed with some of the most dedicated people you'll ever know. People working hard on our behalf, our goals, because they believe in these goals themselves. Who on their own created a rallying cry, declaring why they do what they do to help us fulfill our mission. That's a model of teamwork that we could all learn from and follow. Here's a word from our partners. We are dedicated professionals who serve California's physicians because health matters and people matter. We lead with visionary thinking and innovation to keep the physician-patient relationship at the forefront of the ever-changing healthcare landscape. Our fighting spirit compels us to overcome challenges by harnessing creativity and diverse perspectives. With a culture that strives for excellence, we celebrate wins with opportunities for growth. Mutual respect and collaboration are at the heart of everything we do. We are the California Medical Association. We are the California Medical Association. We are the California Medical Association, and together, we champion the health of all Californians. We are CMA. We are CMA. We are CMA. We are CMA. Somos CMA. So why do I take the time to do that? Because they and we are CMA, and we don't get to do what we do without them. There's not one member of this staff that doesn't deserve recognition. We'll get there. <laughs> Hoping not to offend anyone, I do have to acknowledge a few, including Elizabeth McNeil, one of my first staffers as a committee chair for CMA, now our mother duck as we traipse through DC. Michelle Chapanian and her team. Michelle, you might not have felt ready for this position, but you're damn incredible. Jody Black and her team on economic services returning millions of underpaid claims dollars to physicians. Our incredible GR, communications, policy, membership, and legal teams. Thank you to all of the CMA staff for all you do for us now. And to Dustin, Lance, Francisco, and Janus, my thanks for your leadership, guidance, and friendship. Now, I believe all physicians are responsible to protect the profession of medicine in the present and in the future. No one does that alone. We can do it as a team. 
listening to our colleagues, especially when their insights and needs differ from ours. I'm incredibly encouraged by talking to our medical students and our young physicians with their fresh ideas and outlooks, but still dedicated to the future of patient care. One of those students, Cecilia Bonaducci Leggett, put it best when asked, why would a busy medical student get involved in medical politics? Saying, we believe the future of medicine should have a say in the future of medicine. Now, if only those who want to tell us how to practice our profession could take a leaf from her book, listening to those who actually practice medicine to inform public policy for the future. Fulfilling our mission to promote the science and art of medicine, the care and well-being of patients, the protection of the public health, and the betterment of the medical profession, we must advocate for physicians as professionals, enabling us to do what is right for our patients, to support the supremacy of the physician-patient relationship, which allows the unfettered exchange of information, intimate information, and medical, medical decision-making, aware of but unhindered by purely economic factors. We must support all physicians in all specialties and all modes of practice so patients can choose to receive care in whatever form they find fits them best. Every idea starts with one person. The scholar Hillel said that a single candle can light a thousand other candles without extinguishing itself. Each of us is such a candle. Each can inspire others to res resist forces that impede our ability to care for patients. Each can promote positive change. Each of us can encourage our colleagues to join us, whether actively or simply as members supporting our efforts. Our actions are for all physicians, and no one should be a bystander. There are many issues to address in healthcare, and I don't have nearly enough time to do that today. If you want the 45-minute version of this speech, email me, I'll send it to you. There are issues in our profession that we must be willing to deal with fairly. When we do not, we are hit hard by consumers and legislators swinging battle axes, taking out the good with the bad. Improved care models and electronic records have the potential to improve patient care. But records that serve as audit tools and take time away from patient care are not the answer. Nor are models of care that are built around data for data's sake and bean counting. We must eliminate what is just a resource and time suck and replace those things with new approaches that reduce physician burden while improving care and efficiency. We need those who make the rules to recognize our role and to collaborate with us, not dictate to us. Demanding that physicians have a seat at the table for new reforms is not self-serving. It's necessary to avoid the pitfalls that occur when non-physicians try to modify the world we live in, the world of actual patient care. The to-do list is long. MACRA, MIPS, appeals, audits, DACA, opioid epidemic, Medicaid funding, network adequacy. EHR is designed not for patient care, but as bullet point oriented billing checklists. Myriad prior authorizations, and my particular fave, the interruptive peer-to-peer -peer review done at the convenience of the reviewer while interrupting our practices. We need to stop plans from requiring physicians trained in the practice of medicine to spend more time doing data entry and asking mother may I from third party untrained desk clerks than we can now spare to spend face to face with patients doing what we're trained to do. Programs like Medi-Cal are perennially overpromised and underfunded. Legislators must allocate proper resources opening the doors to both primary and specialty care. Our successful fight with Governor Brown over the tobacco tax funds was not about increasing physician profit. It was about making it more reasonable for physicians to accept Medi-Cal patients, to reverse years of poor access to care for those to whom the state promises access to medical services. Those efforts must continue. Single-payer discussions are in their infancy here in California and in DC. In reviewing and informing proposals for universal health care access, we must be watchdogs against policies that in the long term would be damaging to our patients and our profession. Wary of solutions driven not by thoughtful construct, but political expediency. We're faced almost daily with attacks on ACA. The canceling of CSRs, executive orders for association health plans and interstate sales of insurance, 
that fail to protect hard-fought state protections for both patients and doctors. That's a dangerous game that fails to put patients first. What we need is immediate stabilization of the individual market followed by real solutions that exist within ACA. We can have a discussion about repeal or fix, but we cannot accept willy-nilly picking a part of regulations that damage the public and healthcare providers. We got a little closer last week, but I don't know where that's going either. When considering policy changes, all parties should heed Governor Brown's response to Senator Lara's single-payer proposal. Ignotum per ignotius, explaining the unknown by the more unknown. Or, in Jerry's words, taking a problem and saying you're going to solve it with something that's an even bigger problem. On the public health front, we must continue to focus on educating the public about obesity, healthy choices in food and activity, and we need to work to decrease and eliminate socioeconomic health disparities. Even minor changes are something to strive for. The prevalence of true celiac disease in America is 1%. Others choose to eat gluten-free. Vegetarians account for about 3% of our population. Restaurant menus commonly list gluten-free items. Vegetarian items are usually available on request. Diabetics make up 10% of the American population. Foods on restaurant menus can have a significant sugar content but it's rare to see any designation of low sugar items on a menu, or even on request, find something as simple as a sugar-free dessert appropriate for a diabetic. Is it really that hard to have even a dessert available for 10% of the population to enjoy? It could be a win-win for restaurants. They could sell more desserts, more coffee. But it would be a win for diabetics who wouldn't need to sneak a dessert or feel uncomfortable in a group at a restaurant. Simple, but something aimed at a real health issue. And for those of you attending to tonight's gala, if you want a diabetic dessert, we've asked Disney to prepare something just for you. And they did. At CMA, we seek ways to keep membership engaged in our new processes, to promote diversity throughout the organization, to make our forums and sections more relevant, more involved with those that they represent. A new website allowing two-way communications will improve our abilities to be representational and active in all aspects of the CMA, including our year-round resolution process. I am committed to making sure that the new structure enhances, not disenfranchises, but enhances the engagement of all of our members and this House at all levels of the organization. One of my favorite musicals, and those of you who know me know that I'm a Broadway snob, is the show Pippin. Pippin, Charlemagne's son, seeks out his corner of the sky where he can fit in. But in seeking glory beyond reason, he learns that he needs others. He needs family. I've been blessed with several families. My own family, who I will proudly introduce to you in just a moment. My office family, who are far more than just employees to me. My SDCMS family. Love you guys. My ex <laughs> Go for it. My executive committee family, including staff. I'm already thinking of how sad I'll be in two years when I get pushed off the dais as the next president eject in the process. <laughs> and you, my sometimes dysfunctional HOD family, sitting in front of me. I have found one corner of my sky. It's the California Medical Association. And before I introduce my guests, let me close with this. Pippin sang a saying that's attributed to Aristotle. It's an expression that I intend to use one day at a wedding for one of my kids. No pressure. <laughs> Leave it alone. They say the whole is greater than the sum of the parts it's made of. Pippin was referring to love, but it applies to us here as well. We are much stronger, much greater together than any one of us or any small group of us could ever be. We will have different opinions, and like family, we may argue about those differences. But CMA is where we come together. We can disagree within this House, but once a position is debated and adopted, we present a united face to those who make the rules. That is the essence of our democratic process. I look forward to working hard this year on your behalf. I know that when we work together to find common ground on issues and solutions, regardless of specialty or mode of practice, 
we build an ever stronger CMA, and we prove the whole greater than the sum of its parts. In the words of Sean Rowe's closing song from The Accountant, we can leave something great behind for those who follow. We should and will resist change when it's inherently damaging to the health of our communities and our profession. But when change is needed or inevitable to improve our abilities to care for the public, we must resist our own inertia and fears and work to make such change positive for the betterment of those we serve and our profession. So here's to an incredible productive year and here's to my level five executive committee. Together we have a job to do. We will do it as a team. So hats off to all of you, or rather, team hats on. Let's go get them. Thank you all very much. Now let me introduce my, my guests to you, please. I've really been blessed with an amazing, stable, and supportive staff. When I mention your name, please stand up. Deanne Cooper, my nurse, my office manager. Deanne's actually been with my office since before I arrived there, and she was the office manager of the year in San Diego County a couple of years ago. Well deserved. She's joined by Jessica Navarro, Jolene Hovler, and Gloria Palafox, all of whom make it possible for me to both practice medicine and to serve CMA by their efforts in my office. Thank you. I'd like to take a moment to remember and thank my parents who are no longer with us. How I wish they could be here today to share my moment, but I know they're here in spirit. My brother Stuart, you can stand up, a retired federal worker, and his wife Sue, and they're not so much children anymore. Danny, now working for Epic in Wisconsin, please don't hold that against her. <laughs> and Bree, a junior at MIT. My brother Bruce, a soon to be retired executive with Estellas Pharma and his wife Sandy, and their son Lyle, who works with Mercy Maricopa Integrated Care in Phoenix. My son Neil, an attorney with UBS in Manhattan, and his girlfriend Jennifer. My daughter Allie, a mental health counselor LPC in Virginia. and my amazing, ever-supportive wife, Marcy. She's my friend, my partner for over 40 years. She's put up with my years of education, practice, my work with SDCMS, CMA, and a bunch of other organizations. And she promises to continue to loan me out to the CMA at least for the next two years. I love you so much, and I thank you for your patience, your support from the bottom of my heart. Please come up. Thank you.